Hello everyone. Welcome to the sixth lecture in our cervical cytopathology series. Today we shall take a look at glandular abnormalities. As, we sh as usual, we shall begin with a bird's eye view of the Bethesda system to ensure that we are literally on the same page as far as Bethesda terminology is concerned and this is what we are going to see in the very next slide. As far as abnormalities of glandular cells go, we would like to divide it into four major groups conceptually, although they might not be so easy to reproduce when it comes to interpreting them the interpretation under the microscope. But still, it is an extremely robust framework to get started. So, group one comprises of atypical glandular cells. Group two, atypical glandular cells, but we'd like to commit a little bit more and call it atypical glandular cells favor neoplastic. Group three, is something which we call endocervical adenocarcinoma in situ and group 4 is adenocarcinoma. When it comes to atypical glandular cells, we would sometimes like to just group them according to any identifiable cell of origin. So we might say that these are atypical glandular cells of endocervical cell type, endometrial cell type, or atypical glandular cells where we do not want to commit as to the exact origin of them being either endocervical or endometrial or otherwise. So this is the first group, atypical glandular cells. We are not committing to the fact that whether they are neoplastic or not. In the next group, we see some changes as a result of which we want to commit a little bit further, not exactly pulling the trigger, but saying that atypical glandular cells, but we favor neoplastic. And in this case, we have atypical endocervical cells and atypical glandular cells favor neoplastic. We see that there is nothing called atypical glandular cells of endometrial type favor neoplastic because it has been found that this is not really easily reproducible. So there is nothing called atypical endometrial cell favor neoplastic. It is atypical glandular cells of endocervical or not otherwise specified favor neoplastic. Next is a group without any further subgroups endocervical adenocarcinoma in sight, right? We do not have any specific counterpart of preneoplastic lesions in endometrial adenocarcinomas identifiable on uh, cervical smears, right? So we don't have any of those uh, which you see in histopathology. We don't have a counterpart. Of course, endometrial adenocarcinoma in situ has a counterpart in uh, cervical cytopathology. And finally, adenocarcinoma. You may be able to call them endocervical, endometrial, sometimes extra uterines, and sometimes, of course, not otherwise specified. It is extremely important to get our head around this particular terminology it is a little bit tricky, but once you go over it a couple of times and then you start looking at the, uh, at the smears and then you use it in your practice, I'm sure you're going to get a hang of it. But it is, I admit, a bit tricky. So as far as the plan for this talk is concerned, it is not going to go exactly the way that I have classified them. I'm going to first deal with those lesions involving endocervical cells move on to endometrial cells, and then talk a little bit about extra uterine uh, adenocarcinomas, right? 
I am not going to talk about those specific entities where we do not want to commit as to uh, whether the lesions are endometrial or endocervical. Those are the lesions which are not otherwise specified as far as the exact origin of the cells are concerned. These are lesions where we are unable to put it in either group. So we'll just keep it simple. We are going to put it as atypical endocervical cells, atypical endometrial cells, endometrial adenocarcinoma, of course, endocervical adenocarcinoma come to play, and the extra uterine adenocarcinoma. So first we are going to deal with those where the cells ap are apparently endocervical. So atypical endocervical cells. This is the group in which we use the term AGC, atypical glandular cells, endocervical. So they are more or less uh, uh, homologous, right? So atypical endocervical cells, I'm talking about AGC, atypical glandular cells, endocervical. Let us just remind ourselves that one of the very old terminologies of agus, where you will possibly find sometimes by mistake we use the term agus, atypical glandular cells of undetermined significance. We do not, that particular phrase is discarded, we do not use it anymore. So atypical endocervical cells, we are talking about atypical glandular cells endocervical. This is not the one which is atypical glandular cell endocervical favor neoplastic. So this is just falls short of favor neoplastic. So what do we have here? As far as criteria goes, very important across the spectrum the arrangement of the cells you're going to see the same phrases being repeated over and over again so you, you are going to hear it uh, uh, many many times so as far as arrangement is concerned you look for sheets and strips with crowding these are some very key words crowding nuclear overlap and pseudo stratification the cells tend to have a distinct cell border. This starts getting more and more indistinct as you climb up the later ladder to, say, favor neoplastic, adenocarcinoma in situ, and adenocarcinoma. So the cell borders tend to get indistinct. No hard and fast rule, but that's exactly the way it is. Nuclear enlargements are around three to five times that of endocervical cells. There is an enlargement of the nucleus, there is going to be a high NC ratio. And as far as the chromatin is concerned, mild hyperchromasia, mild chromatin irregularity, occasional nucleoli may be present, right? So the chromatin abnormality is not really very high, but still appreciable to attract your attention. And the amount of cytoplasm can be moderate to abundant, right? Let us look at some pictures. So these are AGC endocervical, right? AGC endocervical. It is, these are not AGC endocervical favor neoplastic. So what we see over here are as follows. So as you can see, there is a bit of an overlap between the endocervical cells. So this is a bit of an overlap, maybe a slight attempt towards the gland formation. There is an appreciable amount of nuclear enlargement Nuclear prominence really doesn't mean anything in this particular context because reactive endocervical cells can show prominent nucleoli. So you are not going to call it AGC because of the prominence of nucleoli. You are going to call it AGC because of the way the cells are arranged with a little bit of an overlap, a little bit of an attempt towards gland formation. We are going to call it AGC endocervical cells appear endocervical. Here it's a much larger sheet of cell and here of course the overlap is far more appreciable there could be a bit of a folding but as you can see over here there's a bit of an overlap there's a bit of a disarray over here and i can tell you there are some people who might just like to call this as agc endocervical favor neoplastic right and uh, there's a quite a moderate amount of cytoplasm a bit of a uh, nuclear abnormality some degree of hyperchromasia so AGC endocervical, some people might go on and call it AGC endocervical favor neoplastic. Who knows? But these are definitely atypical glandular cells. Right. We look at this one. Here, as you can see, there is a degree of overlap here. There is a kind of a nuclear disarray. Right? There's a big mass of cytoplasm. Cells are trying to form a bit of a gland over here. 
over here also there is a kind of a three-dimensional kind of a clustering with a significant amount of nuclear overlap right and overlap coming overlapping coming here and you can see that the cell polarities seems to be lost to a great extent so this of course once again is agc endocervical sometimes there is a very thin line between agc endocervical and agc endocervical favor neoplastic and i can tell you one thing that this is not really uh, amongst experts not always it is reproducible i've seen a number of situations where somebody wants to just leave it as agc endocervical somebody says no i can go a little bit higher agc or favor neoplastic and uh, even higher to say adenocarcinoma in situ but this is just to give an idea that these are the cases where you should not miss them as normal endocervical cells as long as you have been able to pick them up with atypical glandular cells you're pretty you're on the right track and you've done a pretty good job the only thing it's a kind of a gradation of abnormalities that we perceive in our brain and then you put it down in our reports right so one more case of agc endocervical cells are tending to be a little bit columnar right there is a kind of a pseudo stratification the nuclei are lying at different levels okay so and this is a bit of a gland formation over here once again this call it an agc endocervical if you see a little bit more you might favor uh, uh, AGC favor neoplastic. Again, AGC endocervical over here, this is more of an AGC endocervical, with some degree of nuclear overlap, some degree of nuclear enlargement, bit of a chromatin abnormality. Here you see a pseudostratification gland coming together over here, AGC endocervical. Uh, here somebody might even call it AGC endocervical favor neoplastic, who knows. Uh, we are going to talk about AGC endocervical favor neoplastic and AGC uh, and adenocarcinoma in situ very shortly. And this is where we start, we get the first of the slides, AGC endocervical favor neoplastic. Look at the arrangement. Sheets and asini with nuclear crowding, overlap and pseudostratification, almost the same features with a lot of rosettes and asinar formation as a result of which once you start seeing a lot of rosettes, you know, and you see a bit of an asinar formation as you've seen in the previous slides also, we start thinking that maybe we can just go a little bit higher and call it uh, AGC uh, uh, endocervical favored neoplastic. Indistinct cell borders. The previous one, the cell borders were distinct. Once the cell border starts getting a little bit more indistinct, it moves up from just being AGC to AGC favored neoplastic and endocervical adenocarcinoma in situ. Nuclear enlargement, high NC ratio, doesn't really matter. Almost all the cases are going to have that. The amount of chromatin abnormality starts getting a little bit more. There would be a bit of an occasional mitosis with some apoptotic debris. If these things are present, then I feel more comfortable in climbing up the ladder into the realms of favor neoplastic and adenocarcinoma inside. The very next slide, without showing you exactly what uh, uh, what these uh, what these lesions are as far as favor neoplastic is concerned i'm going to show you the next step and that is endocervical adenocarcinoma in situ and then after that we are going to discuss these two entities together look at the arrangement cells in sheets as before clusters crowding always there right overlap pseudo stratified slips how many times have you heard these phrases in the last five minutes rosettes a new term comes up feathering we can see what feathering is but feathering uh, is something which uh, makes us move up the ladder as i said to the realms of adenocar endocervical adenocarcinoma so we are going to see what feathering is the shape of the cells some cells have a definite columnar appearance nuclear enlarged oval to elongated with a high nc ratio Hyperchromasia, chromatin can be evenly distributed to coarsely granular. Nucleoli are usually small or inconspicuous. Mitotic and apoptotic bodies are a little bit more common in these cases. Amount of cytoplasm may be scanty, but it can be moderate to abundant. The background, this is important, is typically clean because if you see a lot of these features and you see a background with a dirty tumor diathesis, it actually means that we are possibly dealing with adenocarcinoma invasive, not adenocarcinoma in situ. So 
a typically clean background is important. So once you put these two things together, we might like to conceptualize it from a more of a philosophical standpoint. So AGC endocervical favor neoplastic versus AIS, which means adenocarcinoma in situ. Now, we, we, we can spend hours uh, you know, trying to differentiate between them, but there is an actual fact, an extremely thin and a very gray line, which separates AGC favor neoplastic and adenocarcinoma in situ. And in such cases, more often than not, subjectivity trumps objectivity, right? And this reminds us of one of the uh, one of the papers just published in JAMA in 2001 related to the Bethesda 2001 system terminology by Dean Solomon. And I'd like to read that part out. The cytologic interpretation of endocervical adenocarcinoma in situ can be difficult and should only be made in cases where sufficient criteria are present. In problematic cases, the interpretation of atypical glandular cells favor neoplastic is justified. So atypical glandular cell favor neoplastic is a kind of a bridge. And that's what I find extremely interesting between atypical glandular cells and uh, adenocarcinoma. And I can tell you there are a lot of thin lines even between atypical glandular cells, atypical glandular cells favor neoplastic, and adenocarcinoma in situ. It is extremely conceptual. It is how far you feel offended, I would say, uh, by looking at the abnormalities that you are seeing. You are, are, are you feeling offended enough to call it adenocarcinoma? Or do you just want to, you know, just uh, get back or, or, or step back a bit and call it adenocarcinoma in situ? The changes, as you can see, and this is what I have actually done. I've gone through the literature including the Bethesda Web Atlas. And I tried to look at it in a very objective manner, based on what uh, has been put down in literature, what is available in literature, what we use in day-to-day -day practice. Because what Bethesda is supposed to be is supposed to be kind of a, a, a kind of a guiding light, right? So we exactly use the phrases, and this is what I've come up with. Let's look at the arrangement. When you look at the arrangement, and try to differentiate between AGC endocervical favor neoplastic and adenocarcinoma in situ, you see everything else is the same except for the fact that in adenocarcinoma in situ, you might find feathering. But once again, feathering is something which is more commonly seen in the liquid-based cytology preparation of sure path. Sometimes we may find feathering in uh, I have seen feathering, I'm going to show you a picture, uh, feathering in uh, thin prep. But can we just use one feature to differentiate? I really don't think so. Uh, so uh, it's more of a quantitative rather than a qualitative criteria. Right. Cell borders, both you can find distinct and indistinct cell outlines. The only thing is that when you see more and more of cells, which are very prominently stand up, as with indistinct outline, you tend to call it adenocarcinoma in situ. Uh, cell shape has something very analogous, round and columnar cells, but as you see more and more columnar cells with columnar nuclei, the cells changes from round to columnar, you tend to go more in favor of adenocarcinoma in situ. All of them are going to have nuclear enlargement high NC ratio, you can't really use it. Chromatin, no, abnormal chromatin, easily identifiable as coarse and heterogeneous in both of them. Mitosis and apoptosis can pre be present in both. Uh, AIS possibly is going to have a little bit more mitosis and apoptosis. So if you see easily identifiable mitosis and apoptosis, you'd possibly tend to call it AIS rather than uh, AGC uh, favor neoplastic. Nucleoli, inconspicuous in most of the cases background is clean. So if I can look at this table and just look at the red points, if you see feathering, if you feel that most of the cells have indistinct cytoplasm, if you see that many of the cells are columnar in shape, and if you see a little bit more of, you know, more easily identifiable mitosis and apoptosis, you tend to call it AIS over AGC favor neoplastic, right? So this is uh, uh, what uh, I feel that we should all know. And, and instead of trying to really, uh, you, know, you know, splitting our hair, 
trying to differentiate between them, we should be aware of the fact this is actually not very easy, even if you look at uh, everything that is available on the plate. And even with uh, years of practice, or, uh, you, it, it might still be very difficult. So let's now look at these cases and let's then look at them together, right? Each one of them can be present both in AGC endocervical favor neoplastic as well as in AIS. I have shown you stuff which is more, most of which we actually call it AIS, okay? But, uh, but these are just representative uh, parts of the microscope. So we are looking at the slide as a whole. So I'm trying to concentrate on exactly the arrangement and the, and the general cytological criteria to make you appreciate what these things are. So here we have, we have is a kind of an overlap. There is an asinar formation, so-called asinar and rosette formation. Cells are going to get a little bit columnar, but they have got a pretty sharp nuclear outline. Some of the cells have a slightly irregular outline, little bit abnormalities of chromatin. So this is one kind of an arrangement, what you might call it AGC favor neoplastic or AIS, depending on how many of the cells that you're seeing or the other changes that you're seeing. In this particular case, there's a little strip of cell. Here the nuclear overlap is extremely clear cut, right? There is a nuclear overlap, the cells are a bit columnar, and there is a, a significant amount of nuclear abnormality as far as uh, you know, chromatin abnormality is concerned. So this is going to start coming out of something which you are going to call benign. You are definitely not going to just leave it as negative for intraepithelial lesion of malignancy. It doesn't really work that way with a small exception which I'm going to talk about a little bit later on. Okay, and this would possibly tend to come out of just AGC. When you see stuff like this, you would like to either call it favor neoplastic or you'd like to call it AIS. Look at this one once again. Once again, the most important thing which I always try to tell uh, uh, during my teaching uh, part, uh, courses is the fact that uh, when I'm teaching my residents is the fact that you look at, you look at the arrangement of the cell. Look at the polarity. And the first thing that is going to strike you when you are trying to identify something as a glandular abnormality is the deranged nuclear polarity. And then you compare them with just benign reactive endocervical cells. And they are going to come up a little bit later in our differential diagnosis part of this discussion. You are going to find that in the reactive endocervicals are usually going to have a kind of a monolayered, well-arranged, well-oriented group of endocervicals. And not over here. Look at them. They are looking in all possible directions. They're a little bit columnar. They tend to produce an asthma here. There is a bit of a pseudo-stratification with nuclei tending to lie at different lines. Okay. So when you see something like this, you know that there is something extremely wrong and we can't just call it benign, okay? And with this degree of abnormality, overlap, pseudostratification, asinar formation, you're going to call it AGC favor neoplastic. Feeling a little bit courageous, call it AIS. Over here, look at this one. I mean, this is absolutely clear cut as far as using the phrase atypical glandular cells are concerned. Go to favor neoplastic. Look at the cells, I've told you. When you see cells which are extremely uh, which, which are columnar, they are no longer round. This is a round cell, but this one is a cell which has been stretched out. It's almost like a cigar-shaped nuclei. Look at the chromatin. It is not the usual, uh, you know, uh, homogeneous chromatin of endocervical cells. No, this is an irregularly distributed chromatin. When you see all these things, AGC favor neoplastic, and this is something like this, I'd possibly pull the trigger and go up straight to AIS, okay, and just not leave us AGC favor neoplastic. And I really, I, I like to commit in that way. Right, once again, look at these cells. You see overlap, you see columnar nuclei, and you see a bit of a pseudo stratification over here. Although there is a pretty significant amount of cytoplasm, uh, I'd call it AGC favored neoplastic, possibly. Uh, uh, in, uh, and because the chromatin, well, a little bit, not as bad as the previous one, mostly due to overlap, nobody can call it favor AIS. Fair enough. Right. Now, this one, well, I, if I look at something like this, I would not, I definitely call it AIS because here you see columnar cells, right? They're present in uh, in different planes with a bit of a pseudo stratification. Look at this very ugly cell over here. Uh, there is a significant amount of nuclear abnormality. 
the, here the cell tends to produce an SNI over here, significant amount of nuclear overlap, very much in the form of deranged polarity. Look at all these things together. It is AGC uh, and the cervical uh, favor neoplastic. But to me, this, if I would go beyond and call it AIS, this, these cells are really, really bad. Okay, this has gone beyond that particular realm of uh, favor neoplastic also. But as I said, we need to concentrate on the fact that we are being able to appreciate the arrangement, the abnormalities in the arrangement of the so-called architectural abnormality, if you can use this phrase on the cytology smear, and of course the nuclear abnormalities. Put all of them together and we have this gradation of terminology, right? Now, this is a different kind of a cluster. This is a last sheet, which is an extreme degree of uh, nuclear overlap, possibly AGC uh, favor neoplastic in this particular case because the nuclear outlines look rather smooth. I do not see that degree of normality of chromatin, okay, marked a degree of nuclear overlap, maybe AGC favor neoplastic. Someone, if they see many of these clusters, might tend to just go a step higher and call it AIS, right? Once again, here, these are two other clusters where you have seen marked suit overlap along with evidence of pseudostratification, some SNI formation, columnar shape, indistinct cell border in some of them, right? So uh, this one, once again, AGC favor neoplastic, AIS, depending on how much you think the abnormality is, but possibly good for AIS over here. And this again, I'd possibly go to AGC favor neoplast cells are more rounded. I tend to pay a little bit more importance on the nuclear shape. If I see uh, a, a cigar shaped elongated nuclei in abundance, okay, then I tend to push it up to the realm of AIS. If I see uh, apoptosis and I see a bit of mitosis, I couldn't get any of the my, my slides. I couldn't pick them up from an archive. Those with apoptosis and mitosis, then of course I try to call it, um, I, I usually call it AIS, okay? So uh, the things which I rely on a lot to differentiate between, uh, to call something, uh, differentiate between the favor neoplastic and AIS would be, one of them would be columnar shape. The other one is going to be presence of mitosis or apoptosis, which are easily identifiable. Okay, here there is a significant amount of nuclear overlap here. The cells are pretty long. This is actually a hyperchromatic crowded group. And this is going to bring us to our next part of the discussion, which we are going to do. So we, some people might call it endocervical, favor neoplastic. Some people might call it AIS, but it could mean neither of them. And we have discussed many of them, uh, some of them in the previous lecture. If you remember, we had discussed something where we are seen as something, those are edge cell involving glands can give the appearance of AGC uh, favor neoplastic uh, uh, or, 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 A, or AIS. So this might not be either of them, just to set the tone for some of the things which you are going to set, see later on as far as the differential diagnostic consideration goes. So while you are, what, what I'm trying to stress over here is that while you are trying to split our brain trying to differentiate between endocervical cells, AGC, AGC favor neoplastic AIS, what we are actually doing is that we are possibly not being able to correctly identify something which is hiding, and that is an edge cell involving gland. So we should always keep that at the back of our mind. Now, AGC endocervical phase. So this is something which I picked up from the Bethesda Web Atlas, which is the bird feathering or bird tailing, looks like a tail of a bird. This is more easily uh, uh, identified on liquid-based cytology preparation and is better seen. I tend to see them more because the place where I, in my hospital, we use thin prep. We do not see this much in liquid-based cytology, but sometimes some of my colleagues from other centers, they, uh, uh, they send me some slides for consultation. When I look at a sure path, I tend to pick these things more in sure path. But of course, this picture is not from those. I just uh, couldn't get anything uh, quickly. So I just used the picture from the Bethesda Web Atlas. This is exactly what this feathering is. Uh, this is one architectural feature which is believed to be something which gives uh, cytopathologists more confidence in calling something as adenocarcinoma in situ. 
This is something which is very close to feathering, which I picked up in one of our smears on thin prep. Not exactly a bird feathering, but just kind of a frilly edges of the border, which resembles bird feathering to a certain extent, but that's the closest that I could get. Right, let's go to the next section, that is mimics of AGC endocervical favor, neoplastic, AIS, and, and the not. So what are the mimics of atypical looking glandular cells, whatever uh, the exact terminology is? So, Atypical glandular cells, endocervical, atypical glandular cells, endocervical fever, neoplastic, and endocervical adenocarcinoma in situ. So whenever I'm using the word AIS, it's actually endocervical adenocarcinoma in situ, as clarified in the very first, one of the early slides on, uh, on, on terminology. So uh, I would like to, there may be many, but I, put, I, I could think of these. Endocervical cells with reactive changes, tubal metaplasia, lower uterine segment fragments, areas as still reactions, ionizing radiation induced changes, and acyl with glandular involvement. The first and possibly the trickiest are endocervical cells with reactive changes. Now, if endocervical cells have reactive changes, there are certain things we should keep in mind. So the honeycomb arrangement of endocervical cells, which we all uh, grew up uh, in, in learning, right? So as residents and our initial, we, we were all taught about this honeycomb arrangement. This is a very, very important phrase because that is one thing, the honeycomb arrangement is maintained in reactive endocervical cells. One of the first things that is lost when the cells become atypical glandular is that we do not see a typical honeycomb arrangement throughout the cluster or throughout the sheet. You are going to start looking at cells which are deranged in far as the polarity is concerned. Okay, that kind of an easy on the eye look of a honeycomb arrangement is lost and you see a kind of a disturbed pattern, which I said offends our, 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 our eyes, offends our view, right? So that's what attracts our attention, okay? And there is minimal nuclear overlap. Some degree of nuclear overlap uh, is okay, right? The cell borders tend to be distinct. A bit of a nuclear pleomorphism is absolutely fine, but not a lot. Uh, round nuclei with smooth outlines, right? So uh, that's that that helps, right? Evenly distributed chromatin. Now all these features may be just present in a few of the cells, as far as uh, uh, you know, when it comes to atypical glandular cells. So if you see atypical glandular cells, many of the cells are going to have irregular nuclear outlines. If you see a few cells with round nuclei, that's 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 pretty okay to still call it atypical glandular. But here. Most of the cells have round nuclear smooth outlines. We look at the whole thing as a group and not get stuck with a couple of cells and forget about the rest, okay? Uh, chromatin, pretty evenly distributed, may have prominent nucleoli. That's something which is very important. Multinucleated giant cells may be noted. So endocervical cells with reactive changes, as you see over here, when there is a reactive changes, the amount of mucin may reduce. Cells can get a bit of a hyperchromatic appearance right? And there is a bit of an overlap, but overall, the honeycomb pattern is maintained here. You can see a bit of an anisonucleus. This actually looks a little bit scary, right? Okay, but still, you can see the very well-maintained uh, uh, honeycomb pattern. So these are endocervical cells with reactive changes. One another sheet of endocervical cell with reactive changes. Just see how well-maintained the polarity is, okay? And you can see the typical honeycomb pattern cells sitting quietly uh, uh, next to each other, like very well-behaved kids, right? And uh, very sharp outlines, some prominent chromocenters over here, but very well-maintained polarity. A bit of an overlap possibly here. Uh, it doesn't really matter. A few neutrophils here and there is fine, right? Now, endocervical cells with reactive changes, once again, as I said, that it tends to lose the amount of mucin, but once again, as you can see, a fair degree of maintenance of polarity, a little bit of overlap is absolutely fine. Sometimes this you may see multinucleated giant cell. This is a, one of our cases, but I couldn't really uh, get the picture right. But you can see that there are three nuclei here with prominent nucleoli, right? And just to put them side by side, let us look at two big sheets. So. To the left are endocervical cells with reactive changes, and to the right is something which you are going to call AGC or AGC favor neoplastic, AIS, or, 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 or the likes, or even, as I said, this could even be a high-grade cell involving gland. So what I'm trying to show you here 
on purpose is this is something which is I am very happy to call it benign reactive this I am not okay I know that this is abnormal and the difference is because of the overlap the deranged polarity and the changes in the nucleus all together so this is benign this is not benign so this is nil this is obviously not nil right whether you call it AGC whether you call it acyl involving glands that is a different discussion but this is just to show you the comparison for example if you look at this here you see a degree of you see a significant amount of uh, uh, an isonucleosis hyperchromasia but again this is reactive changes and it is reactive changes because the fact look at the arrangement of the cell it is still arranged in a pretty much uh, a monolayered kind of a sheet with minimum overlap there is not much of derangement of polarity so this is reactive change of over here just see the nuclei have become elongated there is a degree of overlap there's a kind of a pattern of pseudo stratification here so this since even with this degree of anisonucleosis is is reactive i'm going to call it nil but this is not this is agc AIS or, or, or the like. So this is abnormal. Now let's look at the next thing which can be extremely tricky unless and until you are aware of it. Tubal metaplasia because tubal metaplasia can show pseudo stratification. Sorry about the spelling mistake. It can show rosetting and feathering at the edges may be seen, right? Hyperchromasia may be noted. So all the things that you have seen previously. Mitosis may be present here too. The cells of a round sometimes even columnar nuclei with finely granular chromatin but what really helps you out is if you can pick up the cilia and so not always tubal metaplasia are going to show those changes most of the time they're easily identifiable if you remember i think one of our second lectures or third lectures on uh, nil uh, without organisms and this is again one of the pictures i keep on repeating i showed it even in the previous case this can be confused even with a cell because of the way the cells are but once again, the cells are, have got very abnormal chromatin, a little bit of nuclear irregularity, right? And uh, a bit of an overlap. So you, you, you can possibly um, uh, mistake it or just think in terms of AGC uh, or the likes. And, uh, but then if you look at, you should look at the edges very carefully and you see the cilia with the terminal bar. So it's done. And this is just a, a tubal metaplasia with some amount of ATP, right? So this is just not plain and simple AGC. The other uh, uh, big culprit, the lower uterine segment fragments, if you really don't know how to identify them, you're going to end up making a lot of mistakes, calling a lot of lower uterine segments as AGC or even AGC favor neoplastic and even going to atypical glandular, uh, atypical adenocarcinoma situ. Because of the fact that they produce hyperchromatic crowded groups, the high NC ratio, they can show tubular and branching glands at low power, which is of help. Remember, they will show straight edges. We are going to see some of the pictures. And at the edges, it's very important to look at the edges. You are going to be able to appreciate the uniformity of the cells, even chromatin, and smooth nuclear outlines, which are pretty appreciable. Right, so look at this. This looks as a hyperchromatic crowded group cluster. I think we discussed this uh, in, uh, in, in the previous lecture on hyperchromatic crowded groups when you are dealing with uh, H cell but then if you look at it carefully you see that you can a distinct opening of a gland a mouth of a gland here okay and this is a very straight edge and as you follow so whenever you see huge clusters with one edge straight okay these are lower uterine segments and if you go to the uh, you know go to the edges you are going to see after you come out of this area of crowding towards the edges, once again, you see that the polarity is pretty well maintained, nuclear pretty uniform and long, and they are very sharp nuclear outlines, okay? So these are fragments of lower uterine segments, two other pics of fragments of lower uterine segment. Please remember, if there one thing you need to remember, it's extremely sharp edges, okay? So this is one of the features which helps to identify them as lower uterine segment in this hyperchromatic crowded group clusters. We have discussed hyperchromatic crowded group clusters in the previous uh, uh, talk, and this is one of the DDs, and I told you at that time, take, I'm uh, telling you again, these straight edges are very helpful. Look at the straight edges, look at the cells at the periphery, and you are going to find that the cells show pretty uh, round, uniform nuclei with sharp nuclear outlines. The straight edges are very important. There's another one, I think this is from 
picture from the Bethesda web atlas. They have got these geometric figures. This look at this very straight, looks like a rectangle. And sometimes they're present like this so-called tall, long organoid structures, which are appreciable on low power. This I think is a, from a conventional preparation. The next one, you don't really luckily see that common. Commonly is a area stellar reaction, singly scattered type clusters of glandular cells with moderate to abundant amount of vacuolated cytoplasm, which may mimic a particular variant of adenocarcinoma we are going to see later on. Hyperchromatic nuclei with nuclear, very marked nuclear membrane irregularities. If you don't know that this lady is related to, uh, the, the, the smear is related to, uh, to pregnancy, you're going to make a mistake and call it malignant. And if you go back to the first, I guess the second lecture on NILM, Without organisms, I have discussed a whole host of conditions related to like pregnancy and postpartum period where you can have cells which can look like epithelial abnormalities uh, and, and even higher, right? So uh, be very careful. They show prominent nucleolite. This is a picture which I have uh, courtesy Linda Johnston from a, from a, feed, from a Twitter feed. Uh, this area stellar reaction with cells uh, showing this... Uh, uh, irregular nuclear outline, pretty scary looking. There are abundant amount of vacuolated cytoplasm, right? And if you do not uh, know the the condition, you are you easily mistake them as uh, an atypical glandular cells or even higher, you know, like glandular malignancy. Why not? Right. Endocervical cells following repair uh, and radiotherapy can look pretty nasty, as in this case, there is an enlargement of the nucleus and the cytoplasm at the same time. Okay, very prominent nucleoli, right? And they look pretty ugly. But once you know that there is a history of ionizing radiation, you can attribute the changes to the therapy and not to any epithelial abnormality. This is something which we have already discussed. We're just going to run through it in this particular talk. High-grade cell with glandular involvement. This is an extremely tricky customer, a huge pitfall if we are not aware of it. So many of the times things which we call, and we have seen it in, uh, over and over again, when you have done cytological and histological uh, correlation uh, in our data, published data, things which are uh, uh, easily called as uh, glandular abnormality may turn out to be acyl with glandular involvement. And we have learned more and more about this. We are, we are getting, we, we, you know, we, are, we always get better uh, the ones you make one or two mistakes. So the basically in acyl glandular involvement, what you find is whorls at the center. If you see whorls in the center and aggregates and flattening at the periphery of hyperchromatic crowded groups, it suggests acyl with glandular involvement. The nucleoli actually may be prominent. So if you rely on nucleoli to call a cell an atypical glandular cells versus acyl, you're going to make a mistake. Acyl can have prominent nucleoli if it involves glands. And you can even find pseudostratification and palisading. And some acyl involving glands, you're going to show you a picture, can show tumor diathesis. So this is one pick of acyl with glandular involvement. So see how much, and these are all turned out to be acyls in subsequent histopathology. See how much it looks like glands, but again, Look at the very straight edges over here. Okay, uh, hyper tightening at the center sometimes. Okay, but still it is very, very difficult. Some of the cells are polygonal shape, kind of an irregular outline can be extremely difficult, okay, to differentiate between these conditions. So acyl with glandular involvements versus glandular lesions. Once more here, here it's a little bit easier because these look more of a, like a, a polygonal shaped cells right? Look at these cells on their own. They look like edge cell cells. But one second, they tend to produce these glands, bit of an overlap, kind of a whirling pattern towards the center if it is appreciable. This is involvement of edge cell with glandular involvement. This is, again, looks exactly like a glandular lesion, but look at the nuclear. They look a little bit different than what the glandular, the glandular abnormalities that you have seen so far, right? So um, they are large, they have got kind of an irregular nuclear outline, but they look very, very much like a glandular lesion. Okay, once you know the diagnosis from what has happened later on, it's easy. But just to keep in mind, always when you're diagnosing a case of glandular abnormalities, AGC, AGC favor neoplastic, AIS, some of these cases may actually be uh, 
you know, acyl involving glands. And the key could be looking at other areas where you find typical features of acyl when you do not have any doubt. And then you are able to correlate and say, no, so you have got typical acyl somewhere else where they're absolutely clearly acyl. And then you have these. So most likely this is acyl involving glands. So looking at the entire smear helps. And of course, we should remember sometimes acyl and uh, atypical uh, glandular lesion and ad that is adenocarcinoma in situ can coexist. Right. This is one very, very rare picture where uh, I was lucky to pick it up. So this one is an acyl and you see how the acyl is going and involving the gland. So you really do not see this very, very commonly. I just happened to see one. So I quickly took a snap uh, for my presentations. Right. Acyl with glandular involvements can sometimes cause tumor diathesis as a result of which it might even look as a, 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 an invasive malignancy. Speaking of which, let's time to get into invasive malignancies. Endocervical adenocarcinoma. The key feature, which I always say, is to, to call something endocervical adenocarcinoma, is to be able to identify that in many cases, the abnormal cells are in abundance. So in, whenever there is endocervical adenocarcinoma, there are going to be a lot of abnormal cells as compared to atypical glandular cells, even atypical glandular cells favor neoplastic, even atypical glandular cells, that is adenocarcinoma, endocervical adenocarcinoma in situ. Usually endocervical adenocarcinoma will have a relative abundance of cells and tumor diathesis. These are the two important things, but the cells can be columnar, round, oval to polygonal, doesn't really help. Of course, nuclear enlargement is going to be there. The amount of pleomorphism can be moderate to marked, Right? Sometimes they can have minimal pleomorphism, some variants of minimal pleomorphism. We are going to take a look at a few of them. The chromatin distribution is extremely irregular with areas of chromatin clearing. Right? Nuclear prominence, helpful. Most of the time you have seen AGCs that do not show prominent nucleoli. Right? So prominence of nucleoli, when you see it is either in reactive endocervical cells or in endocervical adenocarcinoma. Right? So prominent nucleoli is something very, very tricky. So if you just rely on prominent nuclei to cause something reactive, you will miss out on endocervical adenocarcinomas. So remember that. Tumor diathesis, of course, is very common. So this is endocervical adenocarcinoma. Cells may be present in these large, extremely tight clusters, very abnormal looking. So see how abnormal the chromatin is, okay? Extremely abnormal, much more than what you have seen so far. There is, of course, this tumor diathesis adherent necrosis, which is adherent to this, which is of help. And you can find both clusters as well as signi scattered abnormal cells, which is of great help. And then you can find these kind of fragment, tissue fragments, and look how abnormal the nuclei are, how irregular the nuclear outlines are. And here, uh, um, uh, some places extremely tightly clustered, doesn't really of help, but you have to just look at the abnormality of the nucleus and you see many many such cells okay and the background shows kind of tumor diathesis okay and uh, sometimes they have this tendency of trapping neutrophils some people say that this neutrophil trapping is more common in endocervical rather than endometrial sometimes they say it is endometrial rather than endocervical i've never not really found that reliable but yes it can help at times and sometimes even with uh, Adenocarcinoma in situ, I have seen neutrophil trapping. Right. Now, this is very interesting. These are the ones with very prominent nucleoli. And because of this prominence of nucleoli, they're staring at you, right, with these neutrophils anyway admixed to them. But these prominent nucleoli would sometimes push you towards at least having a feeling that are we dealing with some kind of repair cells, right? Are we dealing so that, but here, this kind of an uh, the arrangement of the nucleus, okay, the kind of a nuclear overlap, the 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 distinct loss of polarity, right? All these things. Some look at the overlapping over here. Look at the complete deranged polarity. Somewhere the cells are spaced apart. Somewhere it is very tightly clustered. I'm going to show you a comparative picture where I think it's going to make things easier. Uh, you will be able to differentiate it from uh, the atypical um, uh, kind of a repair or, or or even typical repair. Now, of course, you are going to see many such cells. You are going to see a lot of tumor necrosis, diathesis, which is going to be of help. So, an adenocarcinoma versus repair. To the left is an adenocarcinoma. To the right is a repair. See over here, there is a bit of an overlap, but there is a kind of an order to it. 
the nucleoli, the nucleoli, some of them could be prominent. I wish I could show you something with the more prominent nucleoli over here. They can tend to be a bit prominent, but over here it is completely an outlet, it's completely overboard as far as the nuclear abnormality is concerned, the nuclear prominence is concerned, and the deranged uh, degree of nuclear polarity is concerned. Of course, you're going to find background tumor necrosis. So all these things help. This, of course, is this is this is what you're seeing over here, a possible lysed RPC. This is not background necrosis, right? Now, the other problem which one might face is adenocarcinoma versus non keratin squamous cell carcinoma, which we have seen some cases of non keratin squamous cell carcinoma in the previous talk. They can look very, very similar. It can be almost impossible to differentiate, right? And in such cases, one little trick which you can do is that if you have any of the uh, fluid left from 10th prep, you can just run a cell block. And when you do a cell block, you will see that things become much clearer. This happens to be a non keratinous and squamous cell carcinoma over. Uh, an adenocarcinoma. Sometimes it can be of help, sometimes you can't, you can mention that in your report. Sometimes a non keratinous squamous cell carcinoma, what I find most helpful is that if you look at the background, you are going to find some cells with uh, with, with features which, uh, which, which distinctly tell you that this is more of a squamous cell carcinoma rather than a glandular. And in adenocarcinoma, you might find areas of, comp uh, you know, glandular differentiation which you are more comfortable with calling adenocarcinoma, but even then, uh, once the histopathology comes back, you might find out that you have you have called it the wrong way. So that's that's pretty okay as long as you are able to identify them as malignant. Right. This is a couple of variants. One of them is the adenocarcinoma mucinous type. One of our cases from our record. So uh, in the mucinous type, what really puts you off is that you might find very bland nuclear features, and there you can see large sheets of cells with abnormal crowding, which should draw your attention. There may be mucin in the background, but especially on liquid-based cytology, it is very difficult to pick up. You should look for small groups of cells with abundant amount of cytoplasmic mucin that you are seeing over here with some degree of nuclear So this kind of cytoplasmic mucin should draw your attention. And if you just look at the entire smear, if you pick those things up, then it is okay. You can call them as uh, adenocarcinoma mucinous type. And this is one thing which I told you, although looks a little bit different, that when you're looking at area stellar reaction, this also shows this kind of a volume in the cytoplasm. Uh, endocervical adenocarcinoma, villoglandular type, extremely rare. I might have seen one many years ago. Uh, so here, the cells look very, very, very bland. And there is going to be some degree of nuclear overlap. This is from the Bethesda web address. And the key to identifying it, if you are aware, is that when you're looking at the smear low part, you find this kind of a papillary cluster of uh, of, of, of endocervical cells, of, of glandular cells. And this kind of papillary cluster is, is very uncommon in any other lesion. So if you have seen this picture once, this kind of a papillary cluster in uh, 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 cervical smear, apart from, of course, sometimes when you see them in extra uterine adenocarcinomas, uh, this kind of papillary clusters sh with, in, with very bland nuclear morphology should alert you to the possibility of a villoglandular type endometrial adenocarcinoma. So this concludes endocervical, the endocervical group. We are going to next move on to the endometrial group, which is a much shorter one. Atypical endometrial cells, uh, the important thing to start with is somewhere in the middle. So there is, I've already mentioned this, there is no category called atypical endometrial cells favor neoplastic. There is no such category. So atypical endometrial cells, or endometrial adenocarcinoma. Then atypical endometrial cells can occur, could arise as a result of IUCD, so it is extremely important to read the clinical request form, endometriitis, endometrial polyp, endometrial hyperplasia, endometrial carcinoma. All of them can lead like, to atypical endometrial cells. Right? The cells are arranged in small groups with mild nuclear enlargement, mild hyperchromasia, and chromatin heterogeneity. So one might wonder how come endometrial carcinoma can lead to this. Yes, it can. Basically, the well-differentiated endometrial carcinoma can just lead to minimal ATP as a result of which you just call them atypical endometrial cells. Very few cells. And so there are cases where we have called something atypical endometrial cells turned out to be a well-differentiated endometrial carcinoma. We are going to talk about it a little bit later again. Right. Atypical endometrial cells, the key finding and compared to an atypical endocervical cell is the arrangement of the cell. They tend to produce this kind of ball-like clusters, okay? This kind of, it gives you a kind of a ball-like feel, you know? A cushy ball-like feel, small, tight clusters, 
okay nuclear enlargement little bit of nuclear membrane irregularity little bit of hyperchromasia like you see over here you know dark ball like clusters right it's not always sometimes they can be pale clusters with pale cytoplasm especially in patients some times when patients are on IUCD sometimes they can show just single cells okay cells like this look at this cell vacuolated cytoplasm very very difficult to identify unless and until and this is from a case which had IUCD right so and after the removal of the IUCD it all became okay so very very regular nuclear outline single cells and I think I'd shown you one picture in one of the previous lectures and you compared such atypical endometrial cells with singly scattered high-grade cell cells right so it would be very difficult like this cell would be very very difficult right next endometrial adenocarcinoma so very short time we have spent on atypical endometrial cells so the findings in endometrial adenocarcinoma are related to the grade of the tumor okay the cells present in tight clusters and the important thing to remember they form this kind of ball like rounded outline so when i see something which i call malignant and the cells have a kind of a ball like outline okay uh, i think that maybe this is endometrial and not endocervical sometimes they can be present as singly scattered cells too they can show scanty to moderate to abundant amount of cytoplasm and the cytoplasm can be strikingly vacuolated. Again, something which you need to de-learn because we tend to feel that if something has a vacuolated cytoplasm, it is endocervical. The answer is no, not always, right? Very strikingly vacuolated cytoplasm, like a watery kind of a feel in the cytoplasm, is more likely to be endometrial. They show variable degree of chromatin abnormality, nuclear outline irregularities, and nuclear prominence because I told you that the findings are related to the grade of the tumor. So higher the grade, see greater nuclear abnormality. And it will also show you some element of watery diathesis, but this is not really very well appreciable in thin prep or CURPAD. This is better seen on uh, conventional preparation. So as I said, this is a picture from the Bethesda Web Atlas. This is one of our cases, it turned out to be endometrial, adenocarcinoma, well differentiated. Look at this. This tend to show this very vacuolated appearance of the cytoplasm, which I find extremely useful. And one more case, a ball-like cluster, kind of a higher grade tumor, as you can see, greater nuclear abnormality with the uh, irregular nuclear outline, prominent nucleoli, and look how ugly this nucleus is. But once again, please appreciate the kind of a ball-like rounded arrangement and with, with uh, clearing of cytoplasm and same kind of a clearing of cytoplasm over here, the ball-like arrangement of cells. When you see something like this, it turns out to be endometrial rather than uh, endocervical, although I've shown you one variant that is the willow glandular type of endometrial uh, endocervical adenocarcinoma but i but I usually do not see this degree of vacuolation and nuclei in willow glandular endocervical adenocarcinoma are far more bland right this is another one it has a kind of a ball like arrangement towards the end right towards the edges over here i'm sorry and then extremely high grade nucleus turned out to be an endometrial adenocarcinoma might as well be a squamous carcinoma of a non-keratinizing cell type. I can tell you sometimes they can have all kinds of morphological variety. But this turned out, and this one again has a kind of a papillary configuration. There is, of course, a papillary type of squamous cell carcinoma also. But in, that's a different story here. The cells have a slightly opened up chromatin. Look how ugly the nucleus. These are all from known cases which turned out to be endometrial adenocarcinoma on biopsy. This is that well-known or famous uh, uh, phrase which you use watery diathesis but watery diathesis is not very well appreciated on liquid based cytology preparation this is seen more in conventional preparation this is a picture from the Bethesda web atlas right to finish off we come to the last few slides extra uterine adenocarcinomas so you can find malignant cells from other sites in cervical smears and most of the com the Commonly known primaries are, the common primaries rather are ovaries, fallopian tube colon, urinary bladder and breast. Uh, the important thing is that you see clearly abnormal malignant cells, background is clean, right? So that serves as a hint. However, uh, that's why extra uterine adenocarcinoma should be suspected 
when one finds classic features of adenocarcinoma, but the background is clean. Not that the background is always clean. For example, tumor diathesis may be seen in cases with direct extension from more extension into the cervix, most commonly from the bladder, a high stage bladder or a, or, or, or a rectal tumor. So that's important. Uh, this is one of our cases from our archives. It's a conventional smear where you picked up uh, uh, a tumor with this kind of a ball-like uh, outline, flowery, florid shape, shape uh, clusters. And there is a Samoma body. I do not know whether it is very clearly visible. Some of the vacuolated cells turned out to be a serous carcinoma of the ovary. So this is the last uh, slide in this particular lecture. So we have been through almost the entire spectrum of Bethesda. We had begun with the Bethesda outline, then we did a couple of lectures on NILM, a couple of lectures on squamous abnormalities, and one on glandular abnormality. I might put together another lecture later with some of the things, the rare things, which we haven't covered. Uh, thanks for your time. I hope these lectures have been of, uh, of help to you and continue to refer back to them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Nadim, for your wonderful initiative. Thank you.